So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Propulsion Prepreg Lower Extremity Orthotic Solutions webinar. Pleased to have you all with us today. Um, I just asked if you haven't muted your mics, um, please do so. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box and we will address these during the Q&A time. I'm just gonna add a few people more. So our presenters this afternoon, um, it's their evening, uh, they're in the States, is David and Steve Tilgis, both clinical prosthetists and orthotists uh, with a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, in neurological and orthopedic management, as well as rehabilitation. So they'll be presenting uh, this evening slash afternoon. And yeah, look, like I said, any questions you have, please put it in the chat box and they will be addressed during the question, uh, the Q&A time. So without further ado, um, Dave, Steve, well, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joe, or uh, Steve, uh, we'll uh, share our screen here. All right, are you able to see the PowerPoint? All right, um, so like Steve said, uh, Steve and I are both clinicians. Uh, we have two other brothers in uh, the business as well. One's a clinician and one is in lean manufacturing. Um, family owned business. We've been doing this with our father uh, since 92. So we have almost 30 years of clinical experience. Um, and we've kind of launched the propulsion brace uh, back in 2000. 2015, 15. So, all right, we'll kind of jump right into it. So some of the patient benefits um, with the propulsion design is gonna be the uh, carbon fiber material, which is ultra lightweight, um, very strong. Um, it's a modular inner boot system, which makes it very adjustable um, and heat moldable. Uh, improved balance than traditional plastic AFOs, uh, good hind foot control with enclosed heel, um, and then the motion that the brace gives also allows the muscles to still function and uh, not atrophy. Um, energy storing design with adjustability in the posterior strut uh, stiffness along with the toe. Um, controlled tibial torsion, um, increased uh, toe lever for partial foot amputees, and reduced, uh, reduced uh, pressure in the uh, residual limb at the distal end. Each of these braces are going to be engineered specifically for the patient's weight, height, and activity, which we'll kind of get into later on in the presentation to kind of help uh, fine tune that process for you guys. So the benefits of the pre-impregnated carbon fiber versus the traditional uh, carbon fiber designs is that the uh, resin is pre-impregnated into it at a ratio specifically designed for these braces. So we've optimized those ratios for the lightweight um, of the material, but also for the maximum amount of strength and energy storing uh, properties, which gives a very uh, natural gait to the patients. So here's uh, two videos to show kind of the uh, increased stability and balance for the patient uh, versus a traditional uh, plastic AFO, where you have more of a, when you rock on it, you're gonna have um, the whole brace, the heel, and the forefoot lift up where the whole foot's able to stay on the ground as that patient's in standing. So some contraindications with uh, pre-preg material um, are going to be patients that have plantar flexion contractures. You can, you can fit and use uh, a propulsion brace with a a minor plantar flexion contracture of less than a half inch, um, where you need a heel lift of a half inch or, or more 
that would be a contraindication. So um, as long as you're accommodating that plantar flexion contracture with a, a shoe modification or a heel lift directly on the brace, um, it, it would be uh, acceptable. So any rigid foot deformity um, that cannot be corrected with a lateral or medial outflare on a shoe, um, moderate to high tone or spasticity um, because they end up overpowering that, that posterior strut. And then ankle fusions um, with a significant amount of pain. Um, you can use this for some ankle fusions um, as long as you build the brace extremely stiff. So we'd have to use an extra firm posterior strut and an extra firm um, toe plate to really lock that ankle mortis up. So um, those are the contraindications for, for the propulsion. And then <clears throat> the inner boot, we have a couple different designs, a low profile design, um, which is cut down a little lower uh, around the malleoli in a high profile design, which is more like an SMO style design. Um, so if you wanna control varus valgus in the foot, or you wanna provide a little more ankle support and stability, um, the high profile design is, is uh, where you'd wanna, wanna be. Now, each of our, each of our um, patients in our CFAB customers' patients are saved digitally. So if you have a molded inner boot that uh, is worn out or cracks or fatigues, you don't have to recast. You can just fill out an order form, put the patient's name on there or their ID, and we'd be able to carve them a digital uh, model and pull a new inner boot, which should basically fit right into the the shell of the propulsion. So just to go over um, some of the basics in the design of the pre preg propulsion AFO, you have a cuff, um, calf cuff, which is built out of low density polyethylene. So this is all very trimmable and um, heat moldable. Um, it's nice for when you're fitting in off-site clinics and you might not have a grinder or if you're doing a house call, that low density polyethylene is very easy to trim with the scissors and you can just add a little heat to it to buff out the edges. Um, so very easy to fit if you're not in the clinic setting all the time. Um, you have an adjustable posterior strut and we'll show you how to adjust and fine tune that in um, future slides. You have an adjustable molded inner boot. Um, again, you can trim it with the scissors. You can heat mold it um, just like your plastic AFOs. It's low density polyethylene as well. And then you have a dynamic ankle strap, which gives a nice dynamic pull and, and offers really nice correction in varus or valgus, depending on which side you mount that, that ankle strap on. And then it's that ultra lightweight construction, that pre break frame. So we have a couple of case studies to share with you this afternoon. Um, this first case study is of a 58 year old patient. He underwent three knee surgeries. Um, he had to wear a long leg cast for six weeks in the cast ended up damaging his perineal nerve resulting in lower extremity foot drop. So uh, he was originally fit with an off the shelf brace and he had a really high cavus arch. Um, he wore that for three months and the neurologist determined that, you know, it's going to be something more long term. So they wanted a custom AFO build for him. So we ended up fitting him with a custom propulsion AFO. And this shows his gait um, pre and um, post fitting of the propulsion. So you can see we're, we're getting good toe clearance. Um, nice motion at the ankle. Um, this is initial fitting. Let's go to the next one. So now we're gonna look at KAFO um, design. So 
We do a significant amount of KAFOs. Um, this is one of the most lightweight KAFOs on the market. Um, and they're very easy to fit because you have that posterior strut running down and underneath the, the foot. You don't have a lot of areas that you have to heat modify. Um, you don't have to do a, a test socket or a test KAFO um, before you go to the definitive. A lot of times, um, I'd say nine out of 10 times we go right to the definitive because they're, they're so adjustable in the sense that it's, it's a frame system. So looking at the uh, concepts of the KAFO, um, we have an anterior shell on this one. It can be built with a posterior shell if you're doing a locking knee joint. Uh, any free motion uh, knee joints being used, we tend to use an anterior thigh shell just for sitting comfort. Um, any locking knee joint, we use a posterior thigh shell. And we can do um, all sorts of different knee joints. We can do stance control, SPL uh, knee joints. Uh, we do a significant amount of those in the States here for a lot of our customers. So the both the thigh and the calf section are padded with an eighth inch firm puff. And then um, we have the similar similarity to the AFO, um, the lower section, we have the adjustable molded inner boot, the pre-preg ultra lightweight construction. <clears throat> so this is a case study of a 72 year old um, who had a stroke seven years ago. Um, she had left lower extremity weakness, foot drop, severe knee hyperextension, um, secondary to the stroke. So she had wore plastic AFOs for the seven years um, leading up to being fit with her pre-preg KAFO. Um, so you can see that in the next slide. So she had a significant amount of, of knee hyperextension, as you see here. And this was fit at one of our local care centers. So, <clears throat> You can see that whole pelvis is dropping down because that knee hyperextension is causing a leg length discrepancy. So she's having to compensate with added knee flexion on her contralateral side. So that propulsion KAFO was not only extremely lightweight because after the stroke, she had very weak hip flexors, but it was uh, very sturdy for her in that knee holding her um, out of that hyperextension moment. So she was able to return home after being fit with this brace. So he, here we kind of have a, a little video to show you kind of how to help pick out the stiffness of the posterior strut and uh, toe section. Um, this is a good kind of guideline to get you in the right ballpark, uh, but uh, we're always here to kind of help on special cases as well. So. Typically, we'll have the patient do uh, what we call toe ups, and if if they have really weak plantar flexion strength and are not able to do any toe ups, um, we're going to go with an extra firm. If they're able to do one to five of them before fatiguing, then we'll go with a firm. Six to fifteen is going to be more medium, and then sixteen on up, um, we're going to do more flexible. So the posterior strut, the way we design it is off the patient's uh, weight, height, and activity. So we use those, those three categories to design each uh, posterior strut and toe plate specifically for that patient along with the diagnosis. So next we have the partial foot prosthesis, um, which is a great tool. Um, that we use in a lot of our partial feet to give them back that uh, third rocker of gait. Um, it's got all the uh, traditional AFO uh, style heat moldable cuff, inner boot. Um, you can see with a figure eight strap to really lock in that ankle on our short partial feet, like our show part or Liz Franks. Um, and then the toe filler as well. And for, for a transmetatarsal level amputee, we typically use 
a low profile inner boot. Um, and a lot of times we don't even use an ankle strap as long as they're wearing a, a nice shoe that laces up and we'll just have them tie the laces nice and tight so that uh, that holds them down into the brace. Um, but if they need a little extra ankle stability, you can always use the high profile or this is the Liz Frank or show part level uh, inner boot. <clears throat> so this is a case study of a 60 year old male. He's been an amputee for 17 years. He had a bobcat bucket fall off the bobcat and basically amputated his foot on site. And he's a left show part. Um, very active individual. He was a uh, groundskeeper at a, a local college. So he had to walk around on campus daily um, doing grounds work. So he had worn a wide variety of partial foot prosthetics. So we'll see those on the next slide. So you can see he was in a traditional um, prosthetic for many years. Um, and then he went to, um, uh, you can see the evolution of the uh, prosthetics and you can see the propulsion on the far right. Um, one of the comments that he made coming from the traditional style uh, partial foot prosthesis on the left to the propulsion on the right was he would work outside during the winter uh, months. So he said, my leg would always be very cold in the traditional style prosthesis. But in the propulsion style prosthetic, he said, my leg never was cold. It was always warm. And in these style braces, the patient's actively firing their calf muscles and their um, anterior tib muscles. So they're getting improved blood flow and circulation in these style braces. So it's, it was an interesting comment that he made to us um, because he's continuing to use those muscles. So <clears throat> you can watch him walk here. And as he's walking, um, you notice that <clears throat> he drops off to that show part amputated side. So you can see that he has a leg length discrepancy due to his amputation. Um, and he has no propulsion on that left side because he lost his toe lever. So his stride length is uneven and compensated. So this is him from the side walking with the propulsion. So you can see the, the motion that that prosthesis gives him during his gait. And he's able to take a nice full stride. And you can see the plantar flexion at heel strike. So he's got great motion, very lifelike and natural. So this is a slow mo shot. So you can really kind of dial it down and see what that brace is doing throughout the gait cycle. So at heel strike, he has real nice plantar flexion down to foot flat. He's rolling over that toe. He's storing that energy and it's propelling him forward into his next step. So he's able to take that full step. So it's, it's a phenomenal prosthesis for any partial foot level amputee um, in the sense that it gives them back the balance and improved propulsion throughout gait. We, we have a number of our... Uh partial feet amputees come in um, using canes or crutches or walkers. And once you fit them with a device like this, they're able to restore a lot of that balance. And some of them will walk out um, without the use of the device uh, just from the fitting appointment. Um, others will shed it a week or two later, but uh, they really restore that balance and, and stride length back. In one of the one of the comments a patient made to me about two months ago was they said, you know, where I noticed it the most, he was a he was a geriatric patient. He was in his 70s, but he said where I noticed it the most was when I'm reaching up in the upper cabinet of my kitchen cupboards to get something out of the cupboard like a glass. He said, I wasn't feeling like I was falling forward all the time. So it's just the simple 
the, the simple things in life that you take for granted. And, and a lot of these patients, they don't know that this technology is out there. So <clears throat> talking about partial foot level amputations, it's good to realize and know that anytime a surgeon amputates on the foot, they're creating a functional leg length discrepancy because they're allowing that calcaneus to rock forward. So as you can see here, um, on the far left, you have a neutral position. So the posterior heel, um, which is on the P side, you can see that the heel is right here. This is a neutral heel. So if we, if we let that calcaneus rock forward, you can see you get this very large pronounced posterior calcaneus protruding out the back. So just by elevating that foot into dorsiflexion, we're keeping that calcaneus at a 40 degree angle, which is a neutral angle. Okay, this is where it drops down to zero. So very important to, to realize. So this is a slide that shows the functional leg length discrepancy when a surgeon will amputate on a foot. So at a transmetatarsal level amputation, a patient has a three eighths to a half inch leg length discrepancy. So going back to a Liz Frank, they have a half inch to five eighths inch leg length discrepancy because that calcaneus is allowed to rock forward further. Uh, when we go to a show part level amputee, you have a seven eighths to an inch and three eighths leg length discrepancy. So we're talking a significant leg length discrepancy. And you saw it with the patient that was walking um, on, on that last video, as you saw his shoulder and pelvis drop on that amputated side. <clears throat> so this just shows the different levels of amputation. I think we all are familiar with the levels. Um. So we just wanted to go over kind of fine tuning the posterior strut nine times out of 10. Um, you don't really even have to do any grinding on the carbon. You take it out of the box, uh, put it on the patient and um, we're good to go. But if, if we needed to fine tune the strut for um, a more flexible or stiffer strut, there's ways you can kind of grind on the carbon to give you that, uh, that function. So starting on the far left here, if we narrow up that strut, that is going to uh, make the posterior strut more flexible. Um, another way to do that is lengthen the lever arm of the strut. So by coming up here and cutting up and making that strut longer, that's gonna also make the posterior strut more flexible. Um, if you needed to make the posterior strut um, Stiffer, we can come down to the toe and adjust the toe uh, trim lines to simulate the posterior strut getting stiffer. As, as we shorten the uh, toe length on the far right picture here, that's going to make the toe portion of the brace stiffer, which in fact is going to put more ground reaction force on the posterior strut, allowing that to flex more easily. Um, Vice versa, if we narrow the toe plate and keep the lever arm uh, the same length, that's going to make the toe plate more flexible, which is going to reduce the ground reaction force on the posterior strut, simulating that to get uh, stiffer. Um, we do have a casting video that I'll probably share before we take um questions let's see here all right i'm gonna share the screen back i uh everyone should be able to see so 
in our clinic, uh, we accept both casts and scans. Um, the left video is obviously uh, Steve taking a cast of a patient, and the right video is going to be a scan. Um, so same principle, we're going to want to get the foot in um, a neutral position. Um, the thing about these braces that is very important is uh, shoe wear and the heel height of the shoe. So that is a very crucial um, piece of information that we use to design uh, these braces. Um, so on the right, you can see him casting on a, a last of a 3 a shoe. Um, and we're able to do that in, in the CAD software. So if you're taking a scan, you don't need to necessarily simulate that, but uh, we do need that information. In, typically with all of our braces, we will recommend that they're built in a uh, two degrees of plantar flexion while it's in the shoe. And what that does is it preloads the posterior strut, similar to a prosthetic foot, um, so that that patient benefits from the propulsion. Um, it just preloads that propulsion and that spring into the posterior strut by plantar flexing at that two to three degrees. So now if you have someone that has a really weak hip flexor and they have a really hard time clearing that toe because their hip flexors are weak, that's a time when we might recommend building it to 90 degrees in a shoe just to really ensure that you're, you're getting proper toe clearance on that patient. Um, and then one other thing with, with uh, carbon fiber bracing is Dave alluded to the shoe wear is extremely important. And we know that patients have several different shoes. So what we do to typically in our clinic is we'll have the patient bring in all their shoes so we can tell them which ones are gonna work with the brace and which ones we might have to use a heel lift in um, because if they're wearing say a flat, um, you might have to put a three eighths inch heel lift into that shoe to um, get them to that, that neutral feel. So that will reduce the amount of fractures that you see in the foot plate and the posterior strut if you educate the patient um, on shoe wear. And then also going up and down stairs, we want to ensure that the patient's getting as much of that foot onto the stair as possible. We don't want them just putting the tiptoe on the stair and really leveraging into it because else you're going to see fractures at the toe plate or the posterior strut. Um, so if they do a lot of stairs, really educate them on how to properly put that foot fully on the stair. Um, so but all in all, um, it's, it's a great brace, very ultra lightweight and very dynamic. Um, so we, we built these braces um, off the designs of our prosthetics in the sense of having a rigid frame in an inner flexible socket. Um, so we can really fine tune and adjust the, the pre-preg um, to fit our patient's needs. So, so now I guess we'll open it up for any questions on the propulsion line. Thanks, Dave. Steve? Um, yeah, um, any questions, guys, please um, uh, type it away in the chat, chat box, uh, or if you um, do feel free to also unmute and uh, ask your question. Are you guys typically fitting a lot of pre-preg braces or are you using a lot of plastic braces? Good question, Steve. I'll get to that just in a sec. We just got a question here. Um, what is the best way to determine the, the toe stiffness and posterior strut stiffness for the show part prosthesis with cloud filler? So 
That's a great question because they can't do their toe up. So for most all of our partial foot prosthetic designs, we will use a firm posterior strut with a firm toe plate. Um, in, in the high activity patients, we might even use an extra firm posterior strut. And the reason for that is because they don't have the toe, they're limited to their propulsion. So the stiffer the posterior strut and the stiffer the toe is gonna give them that propulsion and that push off during gait. If that posterior strut and toe plate is too flexible, they're gonna just roll over and they're not gonna have that resistance out in the toe to push off of as they're walking. So we tend to use a firm posterior strut and a firm toe plate. And just to add to that too, the, the stiffness, the firmness of those, uh, especially the toe plate, greatly reduces the stress on the uh, distal re residual limb where you, we tend to see breakdown in those partial foot uh, patients. So uh, it really helps uh, prevent wounds in that uh, patient population, especially diabetic. We have a couple wound care clinics um, that will total contact cast and then uh, all their partial foot patients, they'll total contact cast them and then they'll put them into a propulsion um, right after that total contact cast. We'll go to the clinic and we'll cast um, a couple weeks before they come out of the total contact cast and they'll get a propulsion partial foot brace. Um, and we have extremely good success with managing that foot and keeping it wound free um, after that they get out of their total contact cast. But it, it comes down to educating the patient that they have to wear it um, to pre prevent the wounds from reoccurring. Thanks guys. Next question uh, we have here is, how long do you expect these braces to last? Um, where are they most likely to fracture and how often should they be checked? So another good question. So we have patients that have been in them for five, six years and haven't had any issues. Um, we do have some fractures in the toe plates at the metatarsal heads and or at the posterior strut down by the heel. So depending on the activity level of the patient and what they're doing with the brace, um, it, it comes down to really talking to the patient and educating them what they can and cannot do with the particular brace. Um, going up and down stairs, trying to get that full foot on the stair, that's going to really save a lot of fractures occurring at the metatarsal heads. Um, if Dave, if you can go back to your adjustment slide. So one of the things that we do to minimize fractures from occurring is at the metatarsal heads, we cut the, the prepreg in quite a ways so that that toe area flexes on its own and th there's no edge at that flex point on the foot. So that's one of the reasons we do this. We use this toe tongue, we call it a toe tongue um, on the bottom of the brace um, to minimize the fractures occurring at the, at the ball of the foot. But occasionally we do get a fracture and we, we can uh, remake the frame. Again, we have the scan um, saved on file. So um, what you could do is you could, we like to see at least photos of the brace. Um, so we know where it fractured and why it fractured. And then we might uh, have head to foot contact you and make sure that the patient was wearing appropriate heel height of shoes and um, was using the brace appropriately. So. We have a lot of patients that run and are very high activity on these braces. Um, so they hold up very well um, to a lot of high impact. In, in terms of how long should they last and how often they should be checked, um, it all depends on the patient. They do delaminate over time on the higher activity patients. Um, you might get two to three years out of them. Um, on the older patients that are just walking around in the community, not doing a lot of high activity, 
um, they're going to be the ones getting five years out of the brace. So, right. um, how often they should be inspected? I would say every eight month, eight to twelve months. Um, I I tell the patients particularly where to look for fractures so they can keep an eye on it. And if they see something that they don't like, uh, a lot of my patients will just send me a text, um, send me a photo. Um, if it's in between that eight, eight months to a year mark. Perfect. Thank you. Um, do you guys see any results, any different results, whether you get a hand cast or, a, or from scanning? Um, I, I think you get, I think you get uh, a nice consistent uh, result with the scanning. Um, and a lot of the reason being is you can have a hundred people take a scan and you're going to get the same result where you can have a hundred people take a cast and you're going to get a hundred different casts. So I do think uh, scanning does offer a consistency that you don't, aren't able to see in casting. Um, yeah, I think, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, this, the scans fit extremely well. Um, so plus it, it saves on a lot of time because it, in terms of shipping, um, you can email the, the file directly to us. So it kind of speeds up the, the time, um, which is also a benefit to the patient and to you. Yeah, it, uh, I mean... Also, just the time you're seeing that patient, uh, both you can see both these videos. I think our screens are still sharing, but uh, the right video you get. I mean, you you have the practitioner doing a full eval and a scan before the left video is even finished uh, taking a cast, and that left video is even sped up. So just a time saving in the clinical setting is uh, is huge. Great, great. Thanks, guys. Uh, got another one we got. For the clients you're seeing post um, total contact cast for wound management, do you use any additional offloading within the AFO? So what we'll do is we will use the pressure guardian. It's a tool that we use to measure pressure on the planar surface of the foot, and we will fine tune the propulsion prosthesis with the pressure guardian. And we may add a, a metatarsal pad um, or some padding to maximally offload that wound site so that they don't reoccur. Um, and then another thing that we um, use here is uh, Glideware. Um, there's a Glideware sock for a lot of uh, partial feet patients that reduces a lot of the friction. Um, and manages the shear force occurring on a partial foot level amputee. So the combination of those tools, um, we, we get very, very nice results. Um, I don't know if you're able to see our video um, feed. It's kind of small versus uh, what is up there. But if, if a patient does need additional offloading, we have built the propulsions using the Click Medical BOA system. So they're able to really kind of compress that soft tissue up at the, the calf section to really offload that foot and heel. Um, just another one here, the, the order form gives options written as Spanko pad foot plate and firm puff pad foot plate. Um, just to clarify for everyone, if you can just let us know what these actually refer to. So the firm puff is, um, it's an eighth inch uh, puff material. So it's, it, it's uh, insert that goes into the inner boot that just gives some cushion um, to the bottom of the foot. The Spenco it has a little uh, less memory, so it's a little more um, springy in the sense that it, it doesn't compress out as quick. Um, and it has a fabric on the top that helps reduce some shear force as well. So um, typically in our clinic, a lot of our clinicians do not pad the foot plate at all 
because it just adds to bulk um, in the shoe. Plus, it maintains and and uh, it maintains heat, um, and also it holds odor as well. So it uh, it's not as easily clean um, and wiped wiped down. So typically in our clinic, the uh, clinician does not use any padding on the foot plate, but there are instances where you have to, depending on the sensitivity of the foot. And that, and that Spinko is, it's, it's very similar to a neoprene material. And that too is eighth of an inch. So it's very minimal, but still it adds bulk. Great, great. Thank you. Um, do you have any additional quantitative and qualitative outcome measure data on the benefits of the propulsion? So we're entering into a study right now um, with a, a, he's a university uh, teacher who's doing a study on, I believe that they're, they're going to have 14 candidates and they're going to fit each candidate with a plastic AFO in a propulsion AFO. Um, and they're all gonna be, I believe, stroke patients. Um, so that's gonna be kind of rolled out over this 2020. We, we also have a couple studies uh, running with the uh, Veteran Affair Office uh, here in the States, um, the VAs. And those have been going on, I believe, for two years now. Um, they're just really getting numbers behind them. And then uh, they're going to, I think, be um, crunching that data in the next uh, six months to a year. A lot of this, a lot of this technology is uh, newer. Um, it's only been out for uh, a good five years or so. So there's, the studies are just kind of starting to final, finalize and come out. Great, right, great. Right. Thank you. Any other questions, guys? Um, I think there was one more. I hear it's, uh, I guess that had to do with the app. Um, the, the, sorry, the, what app were you using for your scanning on that? Uh, was it, is it on, on that, um, in that video there? Yeah, so th that's something we're beta testing in our office. Um, we're currently in design. Um, and we'll we'll be working with head to foot to uh, possibly launch an app uh, for you guys. So we take STL. Yeah, any files. any STL is great. Um, there's a number of scanners you can use. A uh, number of free scanners. Um, Captivity has a um, free one out there that a lot of people use. Um, but yeah, any STL file we can accept. Um, that's the preferable file size, but there is um, other ones that we can we can get. So the, what you saw in the video is just the iPad with the structure sensor, um, which is a very nice inexpensive uh, purchase if you're just looking to get into scanning. Um, that's what we use in our clinic. We have. Um, probably 10 iPads and 10 scanners, uh, one for each practitioner. Great. Thanks, Mike. Steve. Um, the next question here we have, uh, is the show part prosthesis acceptable to use for exercise in the gym where squatting is required? So, uh, for the squatting, are they going to have uh, weights? on their back as they're squatting down or is it just uh more stretching squats it could be weights uh could it, it could also be potentially leg press where the weights i mean you're, you're you're on a seat or sort of on an incline and you're pushing out um but i i think from this question i gather squatting would mean just free weights um, yeah i would i would tend to stay away from that just from a fracture standpoint because these these braces um are built per patient's height, weight, and activity. So the prepreg, it comes in a very thin sheet form, like a piece of paper. And there we might we might have to lay up 16, 17 layers of prepreg to formulate that posterior strut. And that's based off the patient's height and weight. And if we're increasing the 
the weight of the patient by ex, uh, by by weights that he's squatting or lifting, it's going to affect the functionality of the brace and it could fatigue quicker. And and we do account for people carrying things, but uh, when you're when you're working out squatting with excessive weight, um, that tends to put a strain on it. But we do we do account for people carrying in groceries, carrying um, kids. Um, so that additional weight for their daily activities. Sure, sure. Great. Any other questions, guys? Um, please feel free to post up now. This webinar is recorded, so I will make this available for um, everyone who is registered. So uh, please keep an eye out uh, in the next day or so. Uh, an email uh, with the recording link and if you do have any questions uh, you know in the next day week or so just please email email us directly sales at head to foot orthotics um, uh, sales at htfo.com.au Anastasia I'll, I can send out a price list uh, to you and everyone else uh, who is interested so just keep an eye out in that email with all additional information including pricing warranty etc um, but if there aren't any more questions, um, I think we'll, we'll say thanks, Dave, Steve, really appreciate your time. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. Yes, thank you all for joining and thank you, Steve, for getting us set up. And um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, shoot them to Steve and uh, we, he can touch base with us, so. Awesome, thanks everyone. Have Thank a good, you. Have a good rest of the day. Cheers.